Good morning, AFPI. Thank you for joining us. We're here to talk about the forgotten child. Much has been made of the forgotten man and forgotten woman, and we're here to identify solutions to the many challenges and problems facing America's children, with particular emphasis today on education. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone lived through the pandemic, and screen time is school time. But I can tell you I've never met a single mother in this entire country who has said, you know what my daughter needs more of? Her phone. <laughs> you know what would really help my son learn? Staring at a computer all day. And so people bought into that from March to June of 2020, at the beginning of the height of the pandemic, at the beginning. And then we all had a pretty good summer. And then all of a sudden, we were told in many states, in many jurisdictions, the kids are going to start online again for the second school year. And the net effects of that, the consequences of that, we still do not know in full. What we do know is about 2 million kids left the public school system across this country. What we do know is that 3 million plus women, including me, left the workforce because the kids were going to be home learning. And what we also know in looking at polls right now from Generation Z particularly, is that they are admitting the lost learning has cost them. They're having a difficult time forming and retaining relationships with some adults, some peers, and the mental health challenges and emotional challenges also must be part of our focus. But today we're here about solutions because the school choice, charter school, educational opportunity, freedom scholarships movement is having a moment, an extended moment. Two Democratic pollsters in just the last week or two have admitted in their polling that for the first time in decades, it's pretty much a tie between the two parties on the question, which party do you trust more on the issue of education? I've been around a long time and for years, if not decades, that deficit between the Republicans and Democrats was plus 20, 18, 22, many times for the Democrats. But people are now paying attention. And if the focus is the child, they're saying, great that we have all these tax credit and opportunity scholarship and school choice and charter school opportunities all across this country. We're here today to talk about some of those solutions. And we're here with two amazing, amazing leaders in our U.S. Congress, but really in this country. We have Senator Ted Cruz, who, yes, thank you. It's hard to believe, but you got elected 10 years ago this fall. And even before that and since then has been a tremendous, tremendous proponent of school choice, a real champion for educational freedom. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about the 529 expansion that you led in the United States Senate through the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. But before you do that, everybody knows that he went to great schools, Ivy League schools, but I think it bears telling everybody that his American dream story is everybody's American dream story. His father came here with $100 sewn in his underwear, washed dishes, and got his degree in mathematics in Texas. His mother was one of the groundbreaking women at the Shell Company, also in mathematics. Then we have Congressman Byron Donalds. Also a proponent of school choice and educational freedom, but a product of it, if I may as well. Hardworking, single mom who raised him in Brooklyn, New York. He went to Florida for his schooling, and he has stayed there ever since. And he and Erica have three sons, and of course, Ted and Heidi have two daughters. Between the three of us, we have nine children in school right now, school-age children. And I'm telling you this because I think it's incredibly important through the Center for the American Child, of which I'm the chair at AFPI, that we focus on the kinds of solutions we see now. And that we don't just take this moment to talk about masking up seven-year-olds and critical race theory, both of which are very important to talk about. I know those who follow the science and told us to put a mask on a seven-year-old can't follow the science and tell us what they see in a seven-month-old sonogram. But <laughs> follow the science. 
But also, let's not lose this moment to bring more people on board in this educational freedom movement. And finally, I would say to you, I have never heard in 30 years of doing this, I've never heard a single compelling, persuasive, memorable reason why basically one political party is against everything I just described. They're against giving kids the dignity and the humanity of a quality, affordable education that's worthy of them. If we can't provide every child with the equality of opportunity, looking past where they live, who their parents are, where they work, what their station in life is, they all deserve an equality of opportunity. And 60 years after some bigoted Democratic governors were standing in the schoolhouse door, refusing to allow kids of color into the schools, we have bigoted people all across this country refusing to let kids out of the failing schools to go access those educational opportunities that they deserve. We're here to change that. So with that, we'll turn it over. I know they, they gave me notes. I tried to use them, but I see what happens when our Vice President Kamala Harris tries to use notes, so I'm so afraid to use them. I really am. Just afraid. Um, so here's a guy. I'm confident that. you're going to do better than Kamala. <laughs> So last year, Senator Cruz, you reintroduced the Student Empowerment Act. And this would, of course, expand the 529 college savings program for K through 12. I think that was one of the parts of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that did not, did not get enough attention. Tell everybody what it means and tell us what we all need to know, how that fits into this school choice charter school pro-child moment. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. Let me just start by echoing what Kellyanne just said. I, I think school choice is the single most important domestic issue in this country. I think it is, I think it is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. And, and you think about all the challenges we have, the public policy challenges, whether you're dealing with crime or poverty or welfare or health care issues or substance abuse. We know that education is antecedent to them all. That if kids get a good education, we know that their chances of going down the road of crime, the chances of being trapped in poverty, that the, the chances of health care challenges and, and, and addiction, all of them plummet if kids get a good education. And we also know that if kids don't get a good education, the chances of every one of those challenges occurring rise dramatically. School choice is something in our country, the rich and the middle class have always had school choice. It's an issue, Kellyanne said a minute ago, it's an issue where there is no good argument on the other side. I don't know another issue in politics like this, where, where all of the arguments support school choice. The rich and the middle class, look, Bethesda Public Schools, you've got a bunch of people with a whole bunch of money. If the Bethesda Public Schools had a 50% dropout rate, if of the students that remain there, only 30% of them graduated at grade level reading, if you had drug dealers walking the halls and little girls getting sexually assaulted in the bathrooms, Bethesda Public Schools would be empty. Why? Because the parents have the means. They're not going to leave their kids in a school like that. So they're going to do one of two things. They're going to pay for tuition and send them to private school, or they're going to move and move to a different public school. But they will not leave their kids in that situation. But in the inner city with a single mom who's trapped, that's exactly the kind of schools they're facing. And generation after generation of kids are being left behind. They're being abandoned. And it's a situation where the reason why the Democrat Party opposes school choice, it is simple and it is corrupt. They are bought and paid for by teacher union bosses. The polling nationally is overwhelming. Consistently, 70% or more of Americans support school choice. Consistently, 70 to 80 percent of African Americans support school choice. Consistently, 70 to 80 percent of Hispanics support school choice. 
And yet the Democrats, you know, you talked about, about the Democrats at the school board. Today's Democrats are Bull Connor. They are standing there saying, we don't care that these children don't get an education. They say the answer is always more money. Look, the D.C. public schools spend over $20,000 a student. It's not money. That's not the solution. So I think we have an opportunity to fight on this issue that is powerful and profound. And the pandemic, millions of parents saw what was being taught and were utterly horrified. You know, you guys don't know what a woman is. What the hell's wrong with you? It is an opportunity, and we also saw tens of millions of kids had the schools shut down for months after months, and in many instances, more than a year. It's horrific. It is indefensible. And those children, look, I can tell you when we had the shutdowns going on, Heidi and I at home, you were talking about, we both were at home. I took our younger daughter. Heidi took our older daughter. I got the much easier draw in that. And you had two parents who could be on two computers working with them to do school, and it was hard. I don't know how a single mom with three, four kids did it. And for too many of them, they didn't do it because they couldn't. They were trying to put food on the table. And those kids just ended up not going to school for a year or more. And those children are going to have that burden. They're going to be held back by that for the rest of their lives because idiot politicians didn't care about their schooling. Now, you asked the specific story about 529s. It is the single biggest legislative victory that I'm most proud of in my entire time in the Senate. This was during the 2017 Tax Cut Act, and I introduced an amendment to expand college 529 savings plans to K through 12 education. So 529 saving plans, you can save in a tax advantaged way, parents and grandparents, for college expenses, my amendment said, fine, let's, let's allow parents to do the same thing for K through 12. We voted on it about midnight on a Friday night. And there were 52 Republicans in the Senate. So we're down on the floor of the Senate. And we lost one Republican. Then we lost a second. Susan Collins voted no. Lisa Murkowski voted no. At that point, the Senate floor staff, they picked up the phone. They called the vice president's residence because it was past midnight, he was at home. And they said, Mr. Vice President, it looks like we need your vote. So Mike Pence got in, got in the car and started heading to Capitol Hill. As we're standing down there, I'm, I'm standing along with Tim Scott, dear friend of mine, the two of us are, are lobbying our colleagues trying to get folks to vote for the bill. Joe Manchin walks up and votes aye. And there's an audible gasp in the well of the Senate. So the Senate floor staff, they pick up the phone, they call the vice president's residence. They say, uh, well, Mr. Vice President, we got mansion. Looks like we don't need you. So Pence turns the motorcade around, begins heading back. Manchin goes to his desk, sit down, and a sea of Democrats descend upon him. Chuck Schumer descends upon him. I think they actually began beating him with sticks. <laughs> and five minutes later, Manchin walks forward and sheepishly changes his vote to a no. So the Senate floor staff picks up the phone, calls the vice president's office, said, Mr. Vice President, we need your vote again. He turned the motorcade around a second time. It takes about 20 minutes to get from the Naval Observatory, which is the vice president's residence, to the Capitol about 20 minutes later, almost one in the morning now. Vice President ascended the dais and said the ayes being 50, the nays being 50, the Senate being equally divided. The presiding officer votes in the affirmative. The amendment is adopted. And with that, we passed the single most far-reaching federal school choice bill that has ever passed into law. It stunned the Democrats. They, weren't, they didn't think that would happen. Um, one of the things that we managed to do the next week, Lamar Alexander was sitting on the floor and he said, Ted, I, I can't believe what, what happened last week. You got a bunch of Republicans who never support school choice to all vote with you. And I do think we have a moment where on the Republican side, we're uniting our, our side. 
And the Democrats are so fundamentally indefensible that this is an issue that is winning. This is an issue that is winning in every state. This is an issue that is winning. And it's an issue where, look, the Democrats put themselves out as the defenders of minorities, as the defenders of African-Americans and Hispanics. Right now, both Hispanics and African-Americans are moving right dramatically in their voting. And school choice is a big part of it. And so I don't think we can be too aggressive on this issue. I, I, I can tell you, you and I have known each other 20 plus years. When I first ran for the Senate, I said at the time, I said, listen, if, if when I die, it says on my tombstone that Ted played a meaningful part in bringing school choice to every child in America, I will die a very happy man. I, I cannot think of a more important legacy and a, and a bigger opportunity we, we have to transform the landscape in this country. Thank you, Senator Cruz. We hope that's no time soon, but thank you for your leadership. And I will give everyone here color ahead of the president's, the former president's visit later on. That night was Friday, December 1st, and it happened to be the senior staff dinner um, put on by the president and the first lady in the West Wing in, this, in the state down in the uh, East Room. So maybe, I don't know how many, maybe 25, 30 people and their guests and George and I were enjoying a whole year into uh, Donald Trump's administration, enjoying dinner with the President and First Lady, but the President was getting moment by moment updates on all of those amendments on the vote itself. And the next day I happened to fly with him to New York for a couple of events. And the number one thing that both of us talked about at all those events was what had happened in the dead of night on the 529 because it was such a pivotal moment. And I think sometimes it got a little bit buried in the larger Tax Cut and Jobs Act remarkable feat. But it's, it's really the piece that lives on and can be, I believe, uh, sustained and, and progressed. So now, thank you, and we'll get back to you with other questions. Congressman Donalds, my question centers on prioritization. Because what happens when you're having a very big, robust moment of opportunity like this is we can get our priorities maybe a little skew and focusing on the things that aren't going to electrify and animate and engage most of the, most of the country. So with 84% of voters clearly believing parents should have a say of where their children go to school and what is taught there, Tell us a little bit about what you think we need to know, given your very unique perspective of having been a state legislator in Florida and a champion of educational freedom, and now in the U.S. Congress as a fairly new member. Where should we be putting our time and our treasure as goes educational freedom and students? Well, that's an easy question. Um, first thing, before we get to there, good morning, everybody. Great to be with you. Um, I didn't know that about the 529. So I didn't even know that was you. So congratulations. <laughs> I did. Just... I can't believe it never got any media coverage. It actually, so, so me, let me. Clearly, I need to do better PR. So Russia, Russia, out. Russia. When, <laughs> Russia, Russia, Russia. Oh my gosh. When TCJA was kind of unleashed on the business community, I was still in uh, my financial advisory practice. So we're literally trying to advise our clients about the new changes in tax policy. And in the one pager, there was this bullet point at the end of the page in my firm that talked about the expansion of 529s. So I'm reading it and I was like, they did what? I was like, oh, Washington does do something. That's pretty cool. So actually it was, it's really an honor. Now it's a bigger honor to sit next to you because I didn't know that was you. So congratulations. It actually means a lot to a lot of families. I know that Clients of mine at the time were like, oh, I can do that? Great. And they started expanding their 529s for that specific purpose. So for people back in Southwest Florida who use it, I thank you on their behalf. Um, I think what, what should we focus on going forward? Everybody loves the sexy stuff, CRT, gender identity, um, school board members who are rude and don't want to listen to parents. Uh, everybody wants to focus on Merrick Garland for obvious reasons. Leave the Merrick Garland stuff to us. We'll deal with him. 
Um, when we have control again, we'll deal with him. I think where we should be marshalling resources is in the direction that Florida has been going for a while and actually where Arizona took the big leap forward to actually accomplish. If you give parents the ability to actually have purchasing power in education, it transforms the landscape, it transforms the environment. Because the school district is like any other business, they want market share. You know, Apple, unfortunately, is the dominant market player in telecommunications. The reason why I say that is because I'm a Samsung guy. I'm an Android guy. But, you know, yeah, there we go. We're here. We're here and we're not leaving. But the, re but the reality is, is that these superintendents and these principals are accustomed. In some respects, they feel that the dominant market share just belongs to them and there should be no questions. Because of that, there is no real push, no real need for them to innovate, to increase efficiency, to make it a better learning environment, to make sure that, that their teachers are ready to go every single day. And I'm not talking past the point of the superintendents and the, and the, and the, teach, and the teacher leads that are out there and the teachers who are just self-motivated and want to do the best thing for their kids. Because we have a lot of those that exist in the environment. The problem is is that because you do not have a, a, an economy of education, that there is no external pressure to have that excellence hit the classroom every single day. I like to, I always talk, when I talk about this kind of economy of education, that is where we need to go to, I compare it to telecommunications. Could you imagine if, if the government gave you your cell phone? I know there are some elected officials who will probably want to give you your cell phone, we had a former president who wanted to do that. But if that was the case, you would, you would still be using the Motorola StarTac. Anybody remember the Motorola StarTac? That was the thing with the orange buttons. And if you wanted to put letters in, you had to hit the button like three times, four times to get the right letter. If the government was responsible for telecommunications, we would still be on the Motorola StarTac. Because companies are in charge of telecommunications and because you have purchasing power whether it's through your cell phone bill and you do the 24 month uh, buy down lease deal or you pay for your phone outright, you make a decision of what phone you want and what service you want. And because of that, every single year, Apple, Samsung, LG, et cetera, are all bringing you new versions of the same phone. Maybe they made the speaker louder. Maybe the, the battery's longer. You know, I like, I like louder speakers too, you know. If you bring that into the world of education, what you do is you unleash so many different innovative aspects that need to be addressed today in the United States. Our education system is still based somewhat on the agrarian model. That's why we still have summer vacation. People think it's for, you know, the beach. No, no, no. It's for kids to go back into the fields and harvest while it's time to harvest. And then when it's time to plant and, 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 the, and the fields are being sowed, then the kids went back to school. That's why the school calendar still is the way it is. It's based on that. Now it's because Disney wants to keep summer vacation. But this is a real thing. In Florida, we try to shift the calendar. The number one opponent to shifting the school calendar to address summer slide, which is a real phenomena, was Disney. Disney hated it. Um, I don't think Disney has much say in our state anymore. But... <laughs> They hated it. They heard about that. Okay, that's cool. You guys heard about that. But if you look at what our education system requires today, we're no longer in an age of moving from, from an, an agricultural economy to an industrial economy. We are now an innovation economy and an information economy. So what does that mean? You need to have far more flexi flexibility in ways for children to matriculate. The K-12 system as it exists today isn't going to do that. And it doesn't want to do that because there is no external economic pressure that forces them to do that. If parents have an ability to say, you know what, my child is tactile with their hands, they don't really like school, I wanna find a school focused on trades, which we sorely need in the United States. You can still learn reading, writing, arithmetic, history, but then have a focus on trade work, whether it's carpentry or, electri or electrician work, or, or, or um, if you want to be an auto technician. I have, I have a, 
um, dealerships in my district that say, we'll pay a kid 75 k a year coming out of high school if they're an auto technician. $75,000 a year coming out of high school today if they're certified to do that. If you have a child that wants to follow the trajectory of myself and go into finance, you can have schools that are di dictated to higher levels of math competency. If you want to have children who want to follow the senator's path into the legal field, you can have schools with more of an of a, of a, a, a aspect in Latin, in history, in law, preparing them for college and for, the, and for beyond. You can do all that stuff in a diverse economic environment. You can prepare children for the economy that is to come, not the one that exists today, which nobody really knows what that's going to be. But if something tells me it follows our cell phones, it's going to be far more, uh, far more um, pliable. It's going to be far more customizable. It's not going to be you went to this company and worked for 30 years and then you got a gold watch. We don't even do that now. Imagine what's to come. So if you unleash the apparatus of funding into the hands of parents, what you get is an economy of education where everybody is doing the one thing that every business around the world always does, and that is try to hunt and maintain for market share. That's it. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you both. Senator Cruz, we also see this increase by about 5% through the pandemic of homeschooling families. We saw the first increase in the number of families desiring and then indeed doing, following through on enrolling their kids in Catholic schools, even if they weren't Catholic themselves, alternatives to the conventional public school system. Then we got a boost recently from the United States Supreme Court in the main case, in the making case. And I'd like you to walk us through what you think the implications of that case. Essentially, the Supreme Court found that Maine had violated the, the First Amendment free exercise clause by not allowing parents to choose to use the voucher money to put their kids in a religious institution. Beyond that case in Maine, what are the implications of people actually not just talking about alternatives to the conventional public school system, but availing their kids the opportunities of those alternatives. So people more and more are pursuing alternatives. Uh, the main case, so Maine has an unusual way of handling, handling education because it has some very, very rural areas where there are no public schools. And in those rural areas, what Maine does is it gives a scholarship. It gives a voucher for those rural students to go to a private school because there is no public school for them to go to. And Maine had in its law an exclusion that if, if you're being given this voucher, you can use it anywhere you want except a religious school. And if you try to go to a religious school, religious schools were ineligible. And so some main families challenged that, uh, argued that it violated the First Amendment, the Free Exercise Clause of, of the First Amendment, went to the Supreme Court in 6-3, the Supreme Court agreed, struck down the main law. And what they said is if you're providing this government benefit generally, you can't discriminate against faith. You can't discriminate against religious institutions. Um, I filed an amicus brief in that case on behalf of myself and several other senators. I think it's exactly the right proposition. You know, an analogy you can think of it. Imagine if, you know, food stamps. Food stamps are, are a public benefit. Imagine if you said food stamps, but you can't go to a kosher butcher. And, and buy your food there. You know, the, the principle is the same, that if you're providing it, you can't treat faith as some sort of suspect category to be discriminated against. Now, what happened after the Maine decision? The Maine Attorney General immediately put out this defiant statement saying that, that he's not going to let religious schools participate. He's essentially telling the Supreme Court, go jump in a lake. And he, he says... Well, these schools teach one faith as if it's the only faith. So they've got to teach other faiths too. And he said they also have to comply with our laws, which means they've got to uh, embrace gay marriage. They've got to embrace transgender. They've got to do all, they must change what they're teaching to comply. And it really is reminiscent uh, of the old Dixiecrats who are saying we don't care what the courts say, we're going to fight and defy you. And, and, and I, I think it's, you know, in the 529 legislation, the original one I drafted was far broader because it also covered homeschooling and it also covered children with disabilities. 
And the Democrats, unfortunately, raised a parliamentary objection to a portion of the bill. And so we went to the parliamentarian, um, and, and I did something pretty unusual for a senator. I went and argued my own case in front of the parliamentarian against uh, Schumer's staff. And they ended up succeeding in carving out homeschoolers and children with disabilities. And one of the arguments Schumer's staff made is they said, look, if they start getting, being able to use these funds, they're really going to like it. <laughs> and I was like, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the point. And, and I went to the Senate floor and tried to get it added. The Democrats objected. And, and look, this is where the corrupt corporate media comes in. I don't know of a single Democrat who's been asked, why did you fight to exclude kids from disabilities. So under my original amendment, kids with disabilities, you could save in a 529 plan for, say, therapies, for educational assistance. I mean, it can be really hard to have a child with disabilities. And the Democrats, in just a mean-spirited way, said, no, nope, you're not eligible. Um, I think we have, an, and they did the same thing to homeschoolers. They said the carved homeschoolers out. So I have another bill I'm pushing to put kids with disabilities and homeschoolers back in. But the only reason they're not in is because the Democrats succeeded in cutting them out. I think we have a phenomenal opportunity to keep pushing because they can't defend this. They count on the silence of the corporate media to protect them because they never get a hard question. They never get called to task on it. And, and we need to be vigorously going after them on it. Absolutely, Senator Cruz. You're right. Which is a great segue to my next question for you, Congressman Donalds, which is when did this become a partisan issue? Whether kids, particularly kids who don't have an opportunity to escape those failing schools and access a quality dignity, edu dignity education that's worthy of their humanity, when did that become so crazily partisan? I mean, here in Washington, D.C., if you're fortunate enough to have earned one of the DC scholarships in the Opportunity Scholarship Program, you're 12% more likely to graduate. Um, and it's the Congress that's voting on that because of DC's unusual configuration. How in the world do Democrats look at Washington, DC and say, no, literally? And you wrote an op-ed recently that caught my eye. It's called, How School Choice Helped Prepare Me to Become a Congressman. I'd like you to knit this all together. Tell us about your op-ed, why you wrote it, your experience, but also, do you ever have conversations with other people in the Congress, on the other side of the aisle? Have you ever heard a rational reason why they are standing in that schoolhouse door refusing to let kids out? So a couple things. One, the reason why this is so partisan, and Senator Cruz said it earlier, is because Democrats can't get elected without union support. They can't win elections, folks. The unions support in this country, and it's weird, the unions do this thing where they all band together regardless of the field and say, well, if you attack that union, then you're attacking all unions. It's a very interesting thing because a lot of the union labor in the United States, their children are stuck in these schools. So you figure that the other unions, the electricians union, would be like, yeah, 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 we believe in the union law, but no, no, you guys are wrong because my kid has to go through that too. And I think from a political perspective, if we can pierce that veil and help people, working families all across the country really understand that, you can kind of break that feedback loop that the Democrats are really protected behind. It's easy for them to stand behind that curtain because the union that basically lobbies for teachers protects them every single day. And not only protects them from it, puts out the false narrative that the Democrats are the only game in town for quality education in the United States. I had many conversations, not here in DC, but when I was in the state level, because frankly, education should be at the state level, that for another day. But at the state level, the conversations I would have with the Democrats was, well, if we let some of the kids go, what happens to the kids who get left behind? What happens to the kids who can't move? What happens if they don't have a car? What, if they, what happens if they can't get to this school that you think you say exists? And my comment always was, if there's no vehicle for the economy to develop, 
that you can never answer those questions because you do not know if there's a school that would actually focus on transportation, if there's a school that would actually create a magnet right in the heart of the inner city where, where that's needed. Those things would occur if the economy existed, but because the economy doesn't exist, you're actually redlined. And the most hypocritical argument from the left is that they will constantly bring up the old, 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 old practice of redlining when it comes to finance, super old practice, but they won't talk about the red line that, ex that exists today in the United States simply because they're tied to the union. And the union's number one interest is not even the quality of education. We know that because they didn't want to send the teachers back in. Their interest is just larger, collectively bargained contracts. So the union bosses get bigger salaries and they get more power in the political process. That's the whole issue. I wrote the op-ed because I think, you know, and this is also to Senator Cruz's point, we are really in a golden moment to actually drive a wedge in this, this massive wall that has existed. And I think that, you know, what my op-ed brings to light is the story of so many people across the United States. My mom was a school choice mom before school choice was a thing. And so what happened was when I was in the first grade, you know, they wanted to put me on Ritalin. They were like, this kid talks too much in class. He won't sit down. You know, he's always finishing the test fast and everything. And this is why I apologize to my son's teachers every year, the new ones, because I'm like, sorry, this is who you're getting. It, lo it works out when he get becomes an adult. So trust me, <laughs> this thing is going to work out. But as a kid, yeah. Not going to be good for you. You better be tough, lady. Be tough. You know, if you need me, call me. I'll bring, the, I'll bring the iron hand. But that being said, it's important for people to hear these ideas and hear these stories. One of the things that doesn't get reported about a lot, reported on, at, frankly, at all, is what happened in Florida in the gubernatorial election between Ron DeSantis and Andrew Gillum. Andrew Gillum was running through the state, measuring the drapes in the mansion, thinking he had it in the bag. I knew people that worked on his team. They thought they had it in the bag. But you had the school choice groups in Florida banded together. And what they did is they sent targeted messages to black moms, to Latino moms, um, and to white moms that all take advantage of school choice. And they played the audio of what Andrew Gillum said, that if he became governor, he was going to strip all of the school choice options away from Florida's parents. And then those parents had a decision to make. Am I going to choose history or am I going to choose my child? Parents will choose their child every single time. And so the, you know, the purpose of putting out the op-ed, the purpose of doing this messaging, um, what most people don't know, I ran for Congress t 10 years ago. Back in 2012, I was Mr. Smith. I didn't know anything. I was a guy and I ran and I had fun doing it. It was great. I lost, but it was great. But the thing that I always ran on even 10 years ago was educational freedom. Because educational freedom is the thing that actually allows a young child in the inner city or in a rural area or who just grows up poor to change their economic stripes in life, to change their cultural stripes in life. And if you unleash that kind of power in America, the future of the country is far brighter than anything we could even possibly imagine. I talk with more groups in the inner city where they just want somebody to come in and talk to their kids because they want their kids to get a different perspective in life. Just a different perspective. Imagine if they had a different environment. And so I think that as we take this course, and I think that we should take this course and run with it. And we should run through the brick wall, especially in states like New York, California, Illinois, Maryland, Virginia, who's already doing it. And we run through that wall in these states and you go directly to these parents. These parents want the best for their child and they've already seen the foolishness. They don't want that. Last thing I'll say, and I'm going to bring the sexy topic back in. If my mother knew that the school district was talking to her son about his gender identity and weren't telling her, she would have burnt the place down. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. You don't know, my mom is one of them tough ladies. She would have burnt the place down. As conservatives, 
in the Republican Party, in the conservative movement, in the liberty movement, we should never run away from an issue like that. Because we know the truth and we should stand by it and we should fight for the truth. Wow. That's fantastic, Senator Cruz, Congressman Donalds. Maybe one more question each. Senator Cruz, tie this together, if you will, because um, I saw firsthand it's a little bit difficult to convince a, a, a conservative a president who is going to make good on his promises for school choice and charters when other things are going on, like keeping the promise of seven presidents to move the embassy to Jerusalem and declare it the capital of Israel, when he's busy taking out <laughs> Soleimani and Baghdadi and passing the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It's then you're there saying, well, gee, we need to make good on. You said, <laughs> good job. I'm a you spy. said repeal. Uh, he ran on repealing Common Core. It was one of the three three word promises, along with build the wall and cut your taxes, repeal, replace Obamacare, repeal Common Core. But give us all a little bit of a stiffer spine and a better understanding, beginning with me, when it comes to what is the role of the federal government with all this when we all agree we want parents to have more control over where their kids go to school, what is taught there, have a say in the transparent curriculum. And this is a state and local, if not a parent's issue. Sometimes it's a little difficult for us to say, okay, and now we're here in the federal government, and this is what we can and can, should and should not do. Give us a little primer on that. Well, sure. As you know, I drafted what became President Trump's school choice proposal, and it is legislation to create federal tax credits for contributions to scholarship granting organizations. It was $10 billion a year, so $100 billion over 10 years, for contributions, dollar for dollar credits for contributions, either individuals or corporations that they, they make contributions to scholarship granting organizations. The organizations are based in the states. The states choose whether to opt in or not. The states design the program, the states design the curriculum. So under, under the bill, there was no federal role in any of the substance. The only provision was half of it was K through 12 and half of it was adult workforce development skills training for adults to get get the training to get better jobs. And it was designed so that the only requirement was you couldn't discriminate against private schools or religious schools, that that the money provided had to be provided equally to everybody. Um, and so. I announced that legislation at the Department of Education with Secretary Betsy DeVos. President Trump talked about the legislation in the State of the Union address, called on Congress to pass the legislation in the State of the Union address. Here's the problem, which is that Democrats remain in the pocket of the teachers unions. Part of the reason, by the way, that, that, that I included the half of the program on adult and workforce development is trying to do what Byron rightly said. I'm trying to grow our coalition. Right now, the Democrats don't care that black parents and Hispanic parents want school choice. They don't give a damn. They think the minorities are going to vote with them no matter what. They're not going to figure it out. They're captives, so shut up and let us follow the money. So I'm like, all right, I want to grow the coalition. So what I'm trying to do is get the building trades, get the unions, get the carpenters, get, get the electricians, get the unions on board and the way I'm trying to do that, look, $50 billion for workforce training is a whole lot of skilled workers going in, going into the workforce that the, the, the working trades love that idea, but they're still not quite at the point of being willing to tell Democrats stop blocking it. So, but the progress we're, we're making, so during COVID, we introduced my bill as, as part of the COVID relief package the Republicans were behind, and we got every single Republican to vote in favor of it. It never happened before. It actually drove, drove Mitch crazy because they were trying to put together a package, and, and the mods in the Senate hated my bill. And, you know, I said... You know, I said, look, I mean, Mitch and I actually work quite well together because I'm very clear and transparent and transactional. I said, look, if you want my vote on the bill, include my school choice bill. If it's in there, I vote yes. If it's not in there, vote no. You decide. And so they're trying to, to whip me. And God love him, Mike Lee, who's my closest friend in the Senate. Mike said, I'm with Ted. If his bill's in, I'm a yes. If it's not, I'm a no. 
So we would have these conference calls with all the Senate Republicans where the mods would say, I, I can't do this, it's terrible, it's terrible. I said, hey, that's fine, no problem. I, I don't know how you get to 50 without us, but if you do a different math than I do, you know, I don't know, maybe you're not going to school, I don't know. But let me know, if you want to get to 50, let me know. And it's one of the very few times where Republican leadership ended up whipping the moderates to support the conservative proposal. And it's almost never happens, and we ended up getting everyone on board, which was important, and I'll tell you also, during the shutdowns. So you may remember the first big Democratic so-called COVID relief bill. It had tens of billions of dollars for public schools. I introduced an amendment forced to vote on the Senate floor. My amendment said, look, if a public school, you can have all these tens of billions of dollars if you are open and teaching class in person. If you're open, have all the new money, have at it. But if you're not open, if the school is closed, you know what? You can have all the money you had yesterday. You can get all the money you had yesterday. But the new billions of dollars, let's not give you additional money to stay closed and not teach. And I said, instead, let's take that additional money and give it in $10,000 scholarships to parents so if the school is closed and they're not teaching the kids, the parents can send them somewhere to go to school. Yeah. Yeah. We voted on it. Two things happened. Number one, every Republican voted with me, including, so Susan Collins came up to me and she said, okay, this is just limited during the pandemic. This is an emergency measure. I said, yes. And she said, you know what, this first school choice pro program I, I voted for, and she voted yes. We got every Republican on record. Every single Democrat voted no. It failed by one vote. That means every single Democrat on the ballot in November was the deciding vote against giving kids scholarships when their schools were shut down. I went to Manchin and I said, hey, Joe, remember those five glorious minutes By the way, in the Senate, saying that people could think of all sorts of things. So I was talking specifically about when he supported kids and school choice. And I said, come on, you have the ability. You can be the deciding vote. And he wasn't willing to take on Schumer. And he just said no. And, and, and it, uh, this is a unique moment in time. I hope, look, I'm talking to a lot of candidates who are running for Senate, running for the House. I'm on the road nonstop between now and Election Day. I'm urging every candidate, use that vote, nail them to the ground for this vote. And, and I'll make a final point because we're at the end, but it's something in terms of how do we change it. So something I'm doing in Texas, unfortunately, Texas is way behind on school choice. And I'm embarrassed. I don't like when Texas isn't leading in everything. It, it pisses me off and pisses most Texans off. But the reason is less partisan politics than it is geographic politics, which is Texas has a lot of rural districts, a lot of rural Republicans. In those rural districts, the school district is the single largest employer. And so the superintendents pound the rural Republicans and they're scared to support school choice. And so Florida is way ahead of us on school choice. Arizona is way ahead of us on school choice. And I think it's a crying shame. So I've started doing something really unusual. So most federal office holders, particularly federal statewide office holders, stay out of state primaries. It's, it's frankly good politics. There's when you endorse someone in a contested primary in your state, you get half their friends and all their enemies. And, and so you're frankly an idiot as a U.S. senator to endorse in state legislative races. I don't know of another senator that does it. I do it actively in Texas. And, I, and, and, and when I do so, I, I play in a lot of state legislative races in the state house and the state senate. I have my team prepare an Excel spreadsheet of every vote they've ever cast on school choice. And if you've supported school choice and you're otherwise reasonably conservative, the odds of my supporting you are very high. And if you've opposed school choice, the odds of my supporting you are essentially zero. And I've deliberately made that public. Every legislator knows that because we've had a bunch of races where I come in and when I come in, I mean, I get, get on the radio and I run ads against them and we beaten a bunch of Republicans who voted wrong on choice. And 
That's a great roadmap. And I think you're making the point that the school choice should not be a partisan issue because our kids are not a partisan issue. Yeah, exactly Thank right. You, Senator Cruz and Congressman Donalds. Congressman Donalds, 20 seconds to 30 seconds. Talk to this generation's your mom from Brooklyn or Bernita Springs, Florida, your district. Tell her what she should be thinking about, what her rights are as a mom. First things first, <clears throat> always fight for your child. Never give up. Never let anybody tell you otherwise that it's your child, nobody else's. <laughs> Thing number two, go to those school board meetings and just sit there and listen to what they're saying. Number three, um, and especially in the state of Florida, I don't want to speak for other states, you can get every piece of information that they're deliberating on and take the time to read it, team up with other moms like you, read that stuff. And number four, when it comes to school board elections, don't just wait on the unions to tell everybody's friend who to vote for. You guys start vetting these people and get your people on that dais so you get responsible people who are governing the money that goes into school districts. Excellent. We thank you both so much. God bless you. Okay. Guys, what a great panel. Another round of applause for the congressman, the senator, and Kellyanne.